Good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, welcome to another data science event. Uh, we have a fantastic event tonight. I'm really honored to have Dr. Thomas Hauser and uh, Monty Lenicek here. Um, this is for high performance computing and uh, Python. Uh, just want to say thank you all for helping to make the pool party last month a great success. Met so many wonderful people. Uh, really like to get more of an opportunity to meet more of you and get to talk with you. And I hope that you guys will get an opportunity at these events to meet one another, exchange ideas, and we can uh, have more of a community uh, for data science and related subjects. Uh, we have some really great events planned for the future. Uh, next month, uh, we are going to have uh, Joseph Rickards from Revolution Analytics come, uh, come fly into Denver and talk to us about R and Hadoop. Revolution Analytics is um, uh, putting R and Hadoop together. Um, I think Cloudera is involved and a number, number of other companies. So that's exciting. We're also going to have a panel discussion with the subject, quote, resolved. Traditional statistics is dead, unquote. So that ought to be a lot of fun. Um, so without further ado, I think um, high performance computing is really, really important to data science. I think that the business community and the public sector will embrace high performance computing more and more because the costs are significantly coming down uh, and the cost of obtaining, collecting, curating, and storing data is significantly coming down. And you can do uh, incredible controlled experiments and research when you can't do controlled experiments using high performance computers that you just can't do with uh, normal or even your high powered corporate computers today. So I think that we in the private sector have a lot to learn from Dr. Hauser. Um, and the university research community and how they have been using high performance computing. Um, it has changed a lot in the last 10 years. Again, the costs are coming down so that we'll be able to use it more in the corporate and public sectors. Um, and I think we have a lot to learn. And thank you so much. We're very honored. We're very lucky to have Dr. Housie, Dr. Hauser and Monty uh, Lenicek. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I think the costs are coming down, but our researchers want more and more. So that kind of quiet balance is always out. I mean, I think that you ask my boss, he will say, hey, there's no cost coming down because there's this really big, big demand and it comes from all disciplines on, for, for HPC, for compute cycles. I mean, we have users, geography, uh, the traditional engineering, physics, so it, it's coming really, there's a huge demand on, on cycles. So here's kind of a little bit what I'm going to talk about, my background. Um, I'm actually not a computational a computer scientist. I'm a mechanical engineer, it's my PhD in, in Munich. And I'm going to talk about research infrastructure because it's more than compute. I mean, it's compute, it's the network, it's data, data management. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the trends there, where are things going. So I'm going to talk about networking, that's for me a big, big piece, and I got some funding in that area. Then obviously high performance computing, and that's also a big data uh, source, right? I mean, if you want to analyze data, maybe some of the data is coming from supercomputers, huge models. I mean, Anchor has petabytes of uh, climate data, and they are looking into new ways of how do we analyze that climate data, how do we find events. Um, and then I think the biggest challenge is data and data management. And generally, the trend uh, challenge there is really not storing the data, it's more policies and how do you do sharing. And the goal is really to build an infrastructure. I mean, that's kind of my group's mission to build an infrastructure to enable science. I mean, we have compute, we have the networking, we have, I mean, Monty is a great uh, teacher and consultant for our researchers. He helps them with workflows. So we're trying really to build. Uh, and a great infrastructure for doing computational experiments. So a little bit of my background. So I did my PhD in Munich. I think you're here by my accent. I'm not from Kentucky. 
And so, but after doing my PhD, I actually moved to the University of Kentucky, and it was kind of a, a chance event. My wife, this company, opened an office in Atlanta, and she said, "Hey, why don't we move to the U.S.?" And I said, "Okay, let's do this." I mean, it was right after my PhD, and um, she could write a book on how not to open an office in the U.S. And we moved to the University of Kentucky. She did her PhD there. Then I was a professor in mechanical engineering in the aerospace at Utah State, and at that time I created uh, uh, the Center for High Performance Computing. And then I moved uh, for just a year to Northwestern University, uh, and then really uh, CEO Boulder recruited me. And since I grew up in Germany in the mountains, I, mean, I just couldn't resist. I mean, <laughs> Chicago, I mean, it's nice, but Boulder in the mountains, and growing up near the mountains, I started skiing this four, so there was really no competition between Northwestern and CU Boulder. And I've been here now for three years. I'm also a physics faculty in applied math and uh, adjunct professor in, in computer science. Monty and I are actually teaching a class, uh, high performance computing right now. So I, mean, I don't know who is a student, if you want to learn about HPC parallel programming, uh, we teach that hopefully every fall. Um, we kind of revamp the class this uh, or pick a new textbook, and I think we're really excited about that. So, so a little bit of my background. This is how I started, and this is actually where my boss would get a heart attack, because this is actually what we want to get away from. I mean, if you look at a university campus, there's lots of these little clusters in, in closets, and I mean, this is how I started. Um, we actually um, presented a paper on low cost, uh, so price performance, and we got on our dimension SC. And we got funding from NASA to build kind of custom uh, clusters for computational fluid dynamics code. And we put them all together from parts. The students assembled it, uh, put it in kind of office. And I mean, I still remember the first time we built a machine, plugged it in, everything was working. And then the refrigerator and the room next to it turned on. <laughs> and uh, the, <laughs> so you know what happened. The cluster went down, and Baker tripped. So, and these are the things we actually, this is kind of my mission, we want to bring uh, uh, researchers on campus out of that closet into a professionally managed data center. But this is kind of the, where the, we went away, it was commodity, right? I mean, bio world clusters are typically based, everything is based on commodity. And it was fairly inexpensive to build those, and you could customize it um, for yourself. And I started at Utah State, uh, very similar. So again, these are the things, uh, but I learned. I'm moving now, I mean, these are the things I learned from experience. So I built with students a 64 node cluster in, it was 2002. It was the biggest cluster at, at Utah State at the time. And you can see the, the crazy wiring. I mean, we had actually, it's kind of an innovative network architecture. I worked with uh, a professor in electrical engineering. So we had uh, several network cards per node, so cheaper network cards, and then bundled them together. So it was called a flat neighborhood network. Again, something uh, that really, um, my mission here on campus is not to have those things. And I don't know who knows physics. Is there somebody from physics here? So there are some rooms that look like, maybe not as bad as this one, but I think there are some rooms in physics that look like this, right? There, there are some baker's facts, and there are some machines that are built by, by students. So we want to try to get those out into a real data center. And then, I mean, space is valuable, right? I mean, especially in physics, you want labs, so we want to kind of reclaim that space for, for labs. Um, so this was uh, the start of my uh, center at, at, at Utah State. And yeah, it's a drain on infrastructure, and it requires, I mean, it takes away from graduate students, so there's an advantage in uh, moving uh, letting your machine be managed by uh, kind of a professional staff and concentrating on, on the science. But at that time, nothing like this was available at the, on the campus, and so we started to build this, and then uh, had actually some of my department colleagues, hey, I do have this big class, can I use it for some of my simulation, and then some from the university, and so the university, the Utah State, uh, created. And then I started to improve, I mean, this is already the next cluster at Utah State, um, yeah, I think it says it's the Linux network, which is not in business anymore. And this was already moved into a professional data center. And again, 
some of the things I learned, don't trust anybody telling you that your data, that his data center will work. Because initially I had uh, commitments from engineering uh, to house this cluster. And then I said, okay, here's my cluster. And he said, well, we don't have enough cooling for you. And so I had to kind of co-locate with some IT. Uh, but it worked um, out uh, pretty well. And this is kind of what I'm trying to do here at, at CU. I mean, you have large scale compute, um, and I don't know, did anybody take the Janus tour? <coughs> uh, you guys over there. So, yeah, we have Janus, the Janus supercomputer, so large scale compute. We run our own network, and we just upgraded it to, to 40 gigs. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, about networking, because then networking is a key technology. Um, we don't have visualization resources yet. And um, we also, we're going to launch a large storage system called the PETA library. And um, we already have users on that system from the museum, from uh, LASP. They're using it as a backup site for their Maven Mars mission. So, um, and then I think uh, the MRI machine, they have like, they were kind of the biggest challenge initially. They have like 120 million files on our system, so just the number of files. And then also, one of the things we are working on connecting to the national resources. I mean, we are campus resource, I mean, we are okay, I mean, we are fairly big, but I mean, if I look at some of the seed resources, Monty and I are campus champions, so we can have a faculty to connect to the national resources, one of the really, really big uh, supercomputers uh, that are provided by EC. So I don't know, who knows what EC is? Anybody? So EC is the uh, Extreme Scale Digital Environment, and it's a project funded by the National Science Foundation. And the project itself doesn't provide any compute sizes. It's only there to create this infrastructure so that the different uh, service providers can connect. So again, they are really trying to create a similar infrastructure, but on a kind of a national scale. And then there's the campuses. So this is something that's called campus bridging. The campuses are trying to connect to those in a kind of seamless way. But it's in the second year, and it's kind of a it's at least a five-year project, and NSF is envisioning a ten-year project to get to kind of an integrated uh, national computational infrastructure that integrates large-scale storage, compute, the campuses, and then obviously the individual researcher on each campus. And again, feel free if you have any questions, just interrupt me, ask. I'm willing to answer uh, in between any questions. If you have some comments, I mean, please ask. So this is Janus. Um, the top considerable, I think, when we benchmarked it uh, and was benchmarked in this is number 32. So it dropped to number 240 on the top 500 list. Uh, has a uh, performance of 152 teraflops. And it was funded by the National Science Foundation. And you have the list of the PIs here. Yeah, and it has 1,368 compute nodes with 2.8 gigahertz uh, Intel processors. and then uh, in 40 gig infinite bands network. And Monty is really one of the key drivers to keep the machine healthy for our users. He's uh, consistently running benchmarks on the system to make sure uh, the nodes are okay. I mean, there's always, I don't know, I mean, how many nodes fail out each downtime? <laughs> uh, I think about, right now, about 300. So but this is uh, it's network data, so we're working actually with the vendor to. Yeah. Okay. So these are so there's different node failure modes, so memory and um, so there's memory performance. They are generally fixed by rebooting. Yeah, well we just yeah, so we do that in some this crash. Yeah. So after each job basically you run one of your benchmark one of the benchmarks or each job of a user finishes because we have no guarantee, right? We can't really contain our users. I mean at Northwestern, um, one of my IRs said, hey, we're only planning a well-behaved applications on the cluster. And that just doesn't work in a research environment. I mean, there's no well-behaved research application. They are just <laughs> going by, and I mean, sometimes a user changes the parameter, and then suddenly the nodes run out of memory or I mean, do something else. So there are no well-behaved uh, research applications, at least from, from my perspective. I mean, you can always do something up in this Linux. <laughs> it's hard to contain. We try it sometimes. Uh, for instance, memory is one of the bigger issues. All our nodes are disk-less. So right, if you allocate too much memory, the node will run out of memory, and then things go high wire, haywire. But 
we tried in one case to limit, you can do some parameters that the user can't ask for more memory, but then a lot of codes fail, because they just allocate a huge, uh, or at least say they're going to use a large num uh, amount of memory, and then they really don't use it. And if you limit that, the code fails right at the beginning. So there's, again, no well-behaved research application, in my uh, opinion. So we do this testing uh, constantly uh, on, on Janus. The other thing about Janus, um, which is really nice because I paid a power, power, power bill as well. So it's, it's, it's very energy efficient. And you see kind of the container, so it's housed in a containerized solution. The whole data center, it's, it's a real data center, and it arrived on six trucks, so five modules, uh, two for the machine room, and three for the data center. They were all kind of put on a foundation, screwed together. They were pre-cabled, pre-piped. And then we have an, uh, kind of the cooling tower that was the six truck. And it was put together in about a week uh, with everything because it was all pre-built in Canada and then they shipped it down on trucks here. The nice thing about this, it, it's very energy efficient. You take advantage of the climate here in, in Boulder and it has a PoE of 1.2. I don't know, who knows what a PoE is? <laughs> so what's a PoE? Oh, it's a measure of consumption. Yeah, so it's basically uh, the total power coming into the uh, data center over the power that's used by your computing equipment. So it's always larger than one. And it's basically, so a PoE of 1.2 means you use basically 20% of your energy for cooling. So it has a PoE of less than 1.2. NREL just built, I'm collaborating quite a bit with the National Renewable Energy Lab. They built a data center that has a PoE of 1.06, I think. So they only use 6% of their, as a maximum of their, of the power coming in uh, for cooling the system. So, but in, in this case, it's good, because I have to pay the power bill, and it, I feel it's $250,000 a year just uh, on, on power consumption. So. For what it's worth, most data centers are north of two. Yeah, so yeah. generally, that's, that's generally you, you at least have, uh, have as much energy to cool the systems as to run it. So in this case, yeah, the other really cool data center, if you have uh, time to go to Wyoming, the Henkel uh, Wyoming uh, Supercomputing Center, that's in Cheyenne, it's behind the Walmart distribution, I don't know if you ever try this collection. So there's a Walmart distribution center, and it's behind there. And they have actually a visitor center, and they have also a very energy efficient data center, and I think below 1.1, I'm not quite sure they are, and they have a huge supercomputer there. So what uh, percentage? Total power to use on a daily basis. So I mean, our utilization varies a little bit, but it's 80 to to 90 percent. But then, I mean, I have to qualify that. So that's kind of the code that's running. So on 80 or 90 percent of our resources is code running. But then, could you repeat the question, please, for those that are watching? Okay. On the so what percentage of my uh, of Janus is basically used for the question? So we have a utilization of about 89 percent, depends a little bit, but about 89 percent was, uh, so, uh, but it means only that 90 percent of the nodes are requested by a user and used by a user. Uh, then the next step is a lot of the codes run at about 1 to 10 percent of whatever peak performance. So um, if you look at that, so I basically a 90 percent of my nodes are used. And then they use only 1% of the peak of each node, or 10%. I mean, that's just normal. I think if your code is good, you use, if you can really use the real code more than 10% of the peak performance of a process. And we talk a little bit about, about processor trends at, uh, in the middle of my, my talk. Yeah. So yeah, this is our supercomputer. It's behind the sink uh, building in a parking lot. I know, unassuming there, but it's really a uh, really great tool, I think, for our research. It has transformed some of the work some of them have done. It's nice also to have a local resource uh, for researchers here. Uh, so a little bit about research computing. I mean, we have the supercomputer there. We run actually our own network, so we are treated by the campus as an outside entity from network-wise, because we want fast data transfers. And firewalls are kind of 
that is slowing things down, so we don't have firewalls. Uh, I mean, we have a different security model. So one of the things our users have to use is one of these devices, kind of a one-time password device. So in order to log in, because we we don't have our firewalling and, and uh, security uh, as much security as the campus network. We also we are rolling out our large-scale storage. So the we have actually a storage system that consists of kind of three components. One is active, so this is for parallel, and it has a capacity up to about a petabyte. You can grow that. I mean, we're not starting with a petabyte. We are actually selling storage. So if you are a faculty and you need uh, storage, uh, you can buy storage from us for uh, $100 per terabyte per year, which I think is fairly decent. Uh, and then uh, we also have a large tape library, so that uh, can go to several petabytes, and uh, that's connected to this in a hierarchical storage management system. So you dump your data there, and let's say you don't access it for a week, it gets moved to tape. Still looks like a file. I mean, you do an LS and you see it, uh, it just takes about a couple of minutes when you want to get it back. So this is kind of the large scale storage. And I think Monty is really helping consulting, training, Building software. I, mean, I think Tim is doing a lot of the software building on our students. So we're really trying to help also with this software and then improving workflow. I mean, I think that your talk is a little bit about that. Uh, how do we help? Uh, so before Monty, we had about I think about two hundred thousand jobs a month, if I remember right. And then when Monty came and did some work with users, because we had users, they submitted. Uh, 50,000 10 minute jobs to our scheduler, so lots of jobs, which is not good for the scheduler. I mean, you notice that. And then we had actually our users, this Monty, wrote some tools, local, and he's talking about that, I think, in his next talk. And I think we have now at least half, less than half of the number of jobs now on our system. So, and one of the things is, and that's why I talk all about cyber infrastructure, we really want to kind of create an integrated platform for our. Uh, uh, users for high school code, data intensive and high performance computing. And then also I think a big piece is we are trying to work on education and we do the workshop series. I mean we did Python in the fall and this one is data analytics or what how did you call it? Uh, yeah I haven't I haven't named it yet. Okay. And then uh, Monty and I we also teach the HPC class uh, uh, for for CS. And then I have to mention, we are also, I'm chairing this uh, consortium called Front Range Consortium for Research Computing. And it's really, um, it's CU Boulder, it's the University of Wyoming, uh, Colorado School of Mines, Colorado State, ENCA, NREL, and NOAA. And these are all institutions here that use HPC. And we have similar problems. Some of them are on different scale. And we really try to col collaborate, work on proposals together. Um, do some training, uh, so kind of to, to and share expertise uh, along the, those members. So, for instance, uh, Envel, Encar, and us, we wrote a huge NSF proposal for $18 million. Of course, it didn't get funded uh, for a new system, uh, basically, low power system. I work with uh, Colorado State on some data storage. We're collaborating, so they want to use our storage as a backup site for their. Uh, digital collections, so we have thanks to collaborate here along the different range. And this is kind of for me a little bit about my research interest is kind of benchmarking uh, applied CFD. I actually have uh, kind of co advising one student in mechanical engineering and then really research about cyber, cyber infrastructure, data management, uh, development of cyber infrastructure, and an impact of cyber infrastructure. And then um, working on education, computational engineering, and science. I still think everybody should know about uh, computing and, and how to do that. So, so this is kind of so now looking at research cyber infrastructure, uh, and that's really a big emphasis also at the National Science Foundation. So I'm pretty well connected. I mean, I, I write proposals, I serve on review panels uh, in uh, on at NSF, and nowadays, I mean most. Disciplines are data intensive. I mean, you get you have more and more sensors. You have the large scale computing. They're interdisciplinary. You generally are not the single investigator anymore. I mean, it's not this 
one of the things I was shocked when I arrived at Utah State, there was one professor who said, what, you don't like to work on your own, just on your own? I always work with teams of, and with others, uh, and it's in the institution. And most of our researchers, they collaborate not only within the campus, but they all collaborate across uh, the US, and I mean, even international. And really, computation has become the third pillar of science, uh, and it integrates. I mean, a lot of times now, uh, simulations are done to decide. I mean, we had a talk from DOE. They do simulations first, and then they decide what experiments they're going to do in order to save money on the experiments. And I think that's the same. I work a lot with Boeing. Uh, they do the same things. They do simulations and ex uh, before they really do experiments. And it starts also to impact social science. I mean, I think we work with, we have some project on the census data, uh, proving the accuracy of census data. Uh, and even, especially on the data side, arts and humanities, I mean, we don't have as strong of a, a foot in the humanities yet. At Northwestern, we actually had a social science cluster, kind of food cluster for social sciences, so they could run statistical analysis. Uh, and they were using that uh, quite heavily at the So it, when they were actually running computations, it, the, are they using local storage on the compute nodes themselves, or are they actually writing to the array? So array? right now, all our nodes have no disks. So we have actually, so there's a little, our storage is a little more complex. So we have a, a fast scratch disk system on, on Jams. It's a petabyte of storage. And that's mounted on all the system, and it's, it's fairly fast. So generally, the workflow is you whatever store your input file. So we have actually several file systems. So your source codes are stored in a project directory uh, because that's more it's, it's snapshotted, it's, it's redundant, and then your input files are stored on our scratch file system, and then you run that and write it back to your scratch file system, and then we have this kind of the the archive, the pedal library. So then. You decide, okay, well, I ran 10 simulations. Four of them will look good. The other ones I have to throw away. My graduate student made some mistakes or something. So then you then you store your results on the header library kind of for long term for analysis and maybe for sharing. I mean, that's one of the next things where you want to allow or enable sharing of, of those data sets. So it's a little bit of a complicated work. So we have this local scratch, but we don't have disks in the nodes. And that's actually one of the, I don't think disadvantage, but if I would design a complementary machine to Janus, I would actually put some local disks because there are some applications that would be better for just putting the data, kind of staging the data into a local node, processing and writing it back. So I mean, but that's just where, what we have. So we don't have any disks on the node, so they're all disk disks. So here's how I define uh, cyber infrastructure, and this is kind of my mission here on campus. I mean, it consists of computational system, that's Janus, data and information management, that's our PETA library, and we collaborate with the libraries. Uh, I mean, we have a joint data management uh, group, which I'm refilling a position. So, and then there's instruments. We have this example too. We have the MRI system in the sink building that creates lots of data, puts it on our system. We don't have visualization environments, and then obviously uh, we have we have to. Have, I mean, the analysis has to be done by graduate students, by postdocs, by faculty, by researchers, and then everything is linked together by software and advanced networks. So I really want to emphasize, and that's kind of my next topic, uh, the the networks, and the goal is really to improve uh, research output and great schools. <laughs> So new things that can't be done otherwise. If you don't have those tools, or you can't get those uh, 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 great school discoveries. Uh, yeah. um, so then here are kind of the uh, function and resources. I mentioned that you have the researcher. We are more on the support side with our help desk, uh, education training. One of the challenges, and I talk about this more really, especially on data, is policy and uh, how do you work with data, how do you share their data. Uh, you have your display and visualization. You have storage, 
again, one of the key things right now our storage is basically we tell our uh, faculty no HIPAA, no FERPA, basically data has to be uh, free of any restrictions. And that may not work in all environments. I mean, if you work with Anschutz, uh, they probably need some, some of the data may need some uh, uh, HIPAA compliant uh, storage. So that's one of the things we work on. Uh, you have definitely always security. I mean, I still closely work with our security office in information. And then you have computation, uh, for analysis, for simulation, uh, people need to write programs, uh, and then your instruments. Uh, and it, nowadays, instruments become more and more pervasive. I mean, it's, it's uh, regular instruments. It could be sensors deployed. I mean, there's neon here in Boulder that have the kind of monitoring of uh, uh, the uh, environment. And this, this is all needs to be connected uh, by a fast network. And I'm going to talk really. Uh, about uh, the network in, in a second, because I think the network is really the the key uh, to kind of connect everybody. I don't know. For me, power outage and having no internet is kind of the same, right? If I'm working at home and I'm sitting there, oh my network's out. It's kind of a disaster. It's, I mean, it's more than a couple of hours. And then one of the challenges is, I mean, good infrastructure is often taken for granted. And it's only noticed when it stops functioning. I mean, that's, I think that's what we see a lot of times, right? When everything goes smoothly, nobody complains. But yeah, wait until the network goes down for a minute or for, for not a minute, but for an hour. So we get a lot of tickets uh, uh, about that. So this is definitely a challenge to provide. So I really want to talk about networking because that's uh, really, really important to bring everything together. And one of the key concepts of the National Science Foundation uh, EXCEED program is this campus bridging. Basically, the use of infrastructure. So researcher can basically, oh, I'm using Janus now. I'm going to move to a uh, whatever San Diego machine for data analysis. I'm moving to TAC, the Texas Advanced Computing Center. And so uh, and in a seamless way, so that really doesn't uh, there's a, no difference for the scientists to work at tech uh, or at my or his local workstation or at Janus. And the challenge is, and we experienced this here firsthand, is really the data movement. And the task is to move large amounts, I'm not talking about uh, yeah, some small amounts, really large amount of data. And it's an end-to-end -end problem. In, in, in some sense, I mean, if I'm a researcher here and I want to move data, there's not a lot of control in between, right? I may have control of my local, I can work with IT, but then it goes out to the service providers and then to the other one. So it's a really, really complex uh, uh, problem. And it, it starts with the machine, with the operating system, with the protocol. Uh, and we, were, we have a good case study here. I mean, we have the science DMZ, and I'll talk about that. And we worked with uh, the, our physicists, the high energy physicists, um, and their open science grid cluster. And they constantly complain, yeah, your network is slow, and we don't get the performance, I mean, it's 10 gigs, and we can't get 10 gigs, it's all your fault. And you need to fix that. And then it took us uh, weeks and, and, and weeks, and we kind of debugged, and networking, yeah, there's, it's really not that easy to debug that. And then we actually finally found out they were kind of cheap. I mean, they want to save money. So we had our switch, 10 gig switch, and then they connected uh, a, a 10 gig switch with 1 gig ports, a cheap switch, and they had a very small buffer. So that switch basically, the buffer was constantly overrunning and blocking the data transfers. And so once we recognized, okay, this is really the problem there, we changed the switch, and we actually had success here. We met the expectation. Now they get data transfer rates of 8 to 8 gigabits per second to some of the sites. So they are really, really happy. Uh, but it showed us, I mean, it took us a couple of months to really figure this out. And initially, there was this kind of antagonistic finger pointing, hey, it's your fault. No, it's not our fault. I mean, and we basically finally figured out um, uh, where the problem was. And this is kind of the concept we implemented here. I, I mean, I did this network, and I didn't even know that it was a science DMZ. 
And it basically says, I mean, nowadays, campus IT, it's very protective. It's all about security. I mean, they don't want, I mean, and I, I think that's the right thing to do. I mean, they, that's, they don't want any things to happen, right, to somebody who is working on their PC doing administrative stuff. Uh, but then fireworks, uh, firewalls basically limit data transfers. And you combine also the small traffic, the mice, with the big, large data transfer that high energy physics, for instance, or all users do. And so you really need to separate the, the traffic. And um, so this is kind of a new concept of a science uh, GNC. So it basically splits the network and it's an enterprise with science. So enterprise needs to be secure. Uh, firewall, yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't want, I don't think any enterprise wants to run a network that has, doesn't have a firewall. But then the scientists uh, have this kind of a separate network um, that really is tuned for large data transfer. It's tuned for the, the elephants. And it helps the, the other network too. I mean, that's why my boss here is very supportive because we take the big users that uh, out of the campus network, we don't have to invest as much in that infrastructure, right? I mean, the desktop users, they don't mind. I mean, if they have 10 gig or 1 gig, not a big difference. They can probably stream some more YouTube videos, but for them, it's not that essential. But for the scientists, I mean, if you want to uh, bring in data from, the, for the, from some of the experiments at CERN, you really want to be able to transfer uh, for a large amount, uh, for long amount of times and large quantities. So you want large bandwidths. And the other one is you have to be a little bit more trusting on the security side. On our side, we know we connect. So we don't let any, we are not connecting to anything. Uh, so uh, we can trust others. So if we connect to a tag, we know we can trust them. And then the other thing is the routers are much faster filters than firewalls. The other, uh, what we learned is using the right tools. So now with the science DMC, we, ha we are having a monitoring infrastructure in place with Persona. So that's basically this, uh, kind of nodes and we can constantly monitor, hey, what's gonna happen? Is there performance degradation? And then we can much more easily identify those problems. That's what happened with high energy physics. I mean, that was really something that we started to use Persona, but it took us a while to get going. And, and figure out where the uh, bottlenecks are. Another trend, and we have uh, some equipment here to dynamically allocate bandwidth, so a user can request, oh, I need this data transfer, and I want to schedule this. I want eight gigabits per second, so they can schedule uh, bandwidth. And we are in the exploratory stages of this, so we have uh, uh, an equipment here on campus to try this. And also, one of the things for us is user education. Don't use secure copy. Use the right tool. Use BitFTP. Use Globus Online. That is much more uh, tuned for um, large data transfer. And then we have well-tuned servers ourselves to really support those big, big data transfers. And this was done. I mean, I got funding from a CCNIE program at NSF. And the goal of this program was really to networking staff to work closely with scientists and have some regional, national, or international uh, collaboration. So what we did at CU, we basically upgraded the border routers. So I don't think anybody noticed. So we put two new border routers in place. And for the rest of campus, nothing changed. I mean, the border routers then connect to the firewall and then to our network. So for the campus, nothing really changed. For us, for the science DMC, now we have, I mean, we are still connected with 10 gigs, but we have 100 gig capabilities. It's open flow ready. And we have now a 40 gigabit core in the science DMC. So we have a core of 40 gigabits or storage. Um, and then we have some dedicated curve sonar for monitoring. And Pro is a kind of security. We still want to monitor. So what we are doing, we are tapping into it and looking at the traffic patterns. But we are not doing firewalls. But even then, we can say, hey, there's a pattern that looks like an attack or some machine that's compromised. And then we can do some rules on the border routers and still block that. But it's very different from kind of the approach with, with firewalls. So here's kind of a eye chart. I don't think it's very well visible. But it's OK. So this is our current 
science DMC infrastructure. So these two border holders are new, and then this is kind of the this is kind of a skewed network view. Uh, this is kind of the regular campus network. So here's the firewall, and this is the whole whole campus. And then this is our network. So in reality, our network is much smaller than the campus network. Just so you <laughs> mention, our network is really fairly small. And this is our network. We have the core. Uh, we actually have two 40 gig links connecting those two core routers, and then we connect to our this the HPC app um, into our into the science center, space science center. This 40 gigs. That's where our storage is. We connect into the um, HPC app, and then we have endpoints in physics in Jilla, so certain labs can connect uh, to our network there. I think we have an endpoint at last, BioFrontier, so kind of some of the big users have endpoints to enable fast, fast data transfers. And then one of the things we are exploring, I don't know who heard about it, software-defined networking. This is really where we kind of experiment on the edges, which my view is it's kind of virtualization of networking, kind of abstract uh, control and run it separately from the physical network. I think Google is very big. They run uh, on it on in their uh, van. And the problem is, again, is similar to what I've seen with the clusters is, uh, I mean, you can do it with software, less complex, and hopefully there's a cost reduction to commoditization. I mean, you're not locked into the Cisco's or other uh, vendors. Today. Talking a little bit about trends in high performance computing, I probably should try to you talk about that uh, um, from uh, about those trends. So here's my view of HPC. I'll give you a little bit of background. So here's kind of a, a graph showing how the processes in the top 500 change. And if you look at that, uh, I think there's a, the red one here is the power, uh, but this is kind of the dominating the Intel uh, x 64 and 32 bit Intel. And there's still a little bit of AMD and x 64 the brown one up there. And then I think if you see this little white to the right, there's kind of a spark reappeared. I don't know who knows why it's kind of, why does that appear there? Anybody knows? Anybody following the top 500? This is the spark that got acquired by Oracle. So spark is a sun. Yeah, so it's actually different. I think there's a machine in Japan uh, that uh, is built out of. There was the top uh, for a couple for two years was the number one, and it, it's built out of Stark, out of Stark, out of Spark. It uses Spark processor, so I think that's the reason why it shows up there. Uh, and, and under the top 10, I think there's four power, four uh, IBM, uh, and then some of the, the rest is clusters with accelerators. And um, this X uh, with uh, either NVIDIA or with um, uh, the Intel Pi uh, process. So I hope everybody heard about Moore's law, right? What does Moore's law really say? Transistor density. Not quite. Right? It's kind of on transistor density, right? Size of transistors? Something doubles every. <laughs> Just the density. I think the most law is really, I mean, that's at least, I hope I say it right. It's the numbers, yeah, the number of transistors on a chip uh, doubles every 12 to 24 months. So that's really, and obviously, I mean, it means the processes get smaller, the transistors get smaller, so you can pack more uh, on those. And you can see, I mean, NVIDIA Fermi has 3 billion transistors. So that's uh, kind of Moore's law. And uh, unfortunately, one of the things that happened, you can pack more and more transistors, but you can't increase the clock frequency. So this is un, uh, about, uh, stopped here. 
uh, around, I don't know, 2008, where kind of the clock frequency uh, before you could basically count on, okay, every time, every couple of years, uh, clock frequency increases, I just buy a new processor and it runs faster. Now you can't do that anymore. You basically now, you have more uh, processors on a chip, but then you, you, can, you didn't, so you don't, you have more transistors, sorry, you have more transistors on a chip, but your clock frequency didn't increase. So, uh, what do you do? So there's a kind of a performance gap, and I'll talk a little, a little bit about this. But it still shows the trend still holds that the number of transistors still continues to grow. So that's a trend that still, I mean, this is really empirical, but it still shows that this is still happening. So what is the computing industry really doing? And here's kind of the, uh, I mean, I have a slide, Intel and AMD is very similar. Um, it's basically increasing the number of cores. So instead of having one core, now we have uh, six, eight cores. And then if you buy an Intel Xeon Phi coprocessor, you have uh, 57 to 61 cores. So it's really, I mean, that's the challenge nowadays. And that's why we teach HPC, Monty and I. It's parallelism. You can't get more performance without parallelism. I mean, that's just the. So does this obviate the need for clock speed increase? And obviate, I mean, <laughs> my, I'm, I'm, if I'm a lazy programmer, I would rather have clock speed increase than parallelism, <laughs> right? But, I mean, the reality is there is parallelism, and you have to, to think parallel, and in order to create, get more performance, you have to have parallel code, and you have to exploit parallelism on a massive scale. So uh, I think one of the things that would be useful is uh, the amount of space being spent on-chip uh, on memory, yes, uh, because um, clock speeds can increase, but all that means is you're sitting in neutral going really fast. That's uh, <laughs> um, So if you actually look at clock speed and say, you know, a gigahertz, right? That's so many hex you know, gigacycles or uh, transfers per second, and then you look at the time it takes for you to uh, page fault or cache line fault between onboard cache and DRAM, right? If you're sitting there waiting for the equivalent of about a million calculations per second. Uh, so that's why parallelism yes. helps because you've got multiple things being worked on. Uh, but, but you still have to get the data in. I mean, that's kind of, we are, we are right now in. One of the things we teach right now in the HPC class is the memory access and cache misses and latency and, and, and how much the CPU really idles when you access memory. I mean, and that, that's really, yeah, more and more of the chip uh, real estate is really used by caches, right? I mean, you have L3 cache that's shared generally, I mean, on these new processors that's shared between the cores, and then each of the cores has an L2 cache and an L1 cache, and then you have a TLB. And, and so, it's, I mean, what I tell my students is it's about memory access and the cycles are basically free. The, the compute cycles are free. If you, get, you have to really optimize for memory access. And if you do that well, the compute cycles really don't matter that much. Yeah, actually, it would be interesting to see a graph on cache memory size increase over time. Um, yeah, that's a good, good point. You'll see the real bottleneck. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And then you have, again, you have also the parallelism on the instruction level, right? You have, uh, you can see that SIMD, so that means six <coughs> instruction multiple data. So in this case, you have SSC2, so you can do two cloning point operation at the same time. So it's kind of vector, and you can see how, how that increases now with the Sandy Bridge, or even on, on the Phi, you have uh, twice as uh, have these larger vector registers. So again, even on, on that level, but I, I agree with you. I think the, the main bottleneck in, in is kind of the memory memory access, and and, uh, and the memory just doesn't keep up with with, with the, the process. So yeah, that's why we teach, and that's what we teach our students to measure their codes, look at L2 cache misses, how do they optimize. Uh, profile their code, so, uh, but that's kind of the trend, and 
then you have massive parallel clusters. I mean, if you, if you want to achieve a pedal block, you have tens of or hundreds of thousands of, of cores there in order to achieve that. And a little bit want to talk about steep paths to extra scale. I think one of the biggest challenges there is to reduce the power use. And uh, I believe if you build an extra scale machine, if you have the money to do this, this car technology would uh, approximately consume a gigawatt. So half of Hoover Dam just use current, I mean, and that probably that power bill will nobody wants to pay that. But even if you extrapolate, I mean, there's always, every time you, you uh, make your, you improve your processes, the machine would still, uh, right now, with, with, with standard technology progression, would uh, uh, use about 200 megawatts if you extrapolate. And it's still about $250 million per year uh, power bill. So this is one of the big challenges getting to extra scale. And exascale is, I mean, there's computational problems you really want to solve if you want to do a full simulation, much more high resolution simulation of the climate or nuclear uh, simulation. And then I think, yeah, how do you address memory? And I think there's also an interesting trend, different memory types. I had some discussion there. There's this phase change memory. Uh, and so there's some interesting developments there. One of the big challenges. These big machines, there's constantly failure. How do you work with your codes on failure, fault tolerance? I don't think a lot of codes are ready to deal. I mean, if Monty actually will talk about this. I think that's interesting. I mean, it's in a different scenario. But we have some tools that actually survive uh, known failure and then can continue. Versus MPI fails, basically. You have standard MPI and known fails. The MPI code is standard MPI fails. And then you have to explore really massive parallelism. I mean, I looked at the top uh, 500 list, and four of these supercomputers have accelerators. These are GPUs, or Intel is on 5 so you have to leverage those uh, on uh, the computing side. Any comments? I know you are really the more computer architect than I am, so any comments on Exascale? Or, uh, you. <laughs> uh, well, so a couple of things. Uh, on memory, so you mentioned phase change. Um, so there's uh, spin door, phase change, memory store, et cetera. Yeah. What they all have in common is because they're persistent memories, uh, they do, don't consume power uh, when not being accessed. Right? Yeah. So unlike DRAM, where you have refresh cycles, yeah. those go away. So that will actually address power quite a bit. But more importantly, this is really from the software side of the house. Um, we need to now think about our codes differently because the implication of persistent memory means that all of the things that have been built in layers that deals with committing and making sure uh, data is uh, made safe or stable, uh, all those assumptions change. Uh, so the opportunity is for software architecture to fundamentally change uh, to take that into account. Um, and address the, the resiliency fault tolerance. That's for communication. So yeah. earlier you talked about networking. Um, I think the transition in systems architecture is going from where the world thinks server centric, right? That's why we keep quoting Moore's law, right? Yeah. Uh, but the direction going forward is really the system is network centric and. and let me substitute the word fabric instead of network, uh, because then all your computational elements are on the periphery, right? And because they can fail, they can be substituted. The fault tolerance is on the edge, and it's really about cross communication. So you know whether you're looking at your GPUs and, and fine, right? they have great processing power. The biggest bottleneck is getting data. Onto the GPUs, right? yeah. you've got you're limited by you even getting it from the disk, memory. right? Moving it up from the disk, <laughs> right. and, and, to, and so parallelism is great when you're starting the problem and, and, and segmenting it and breaking it down and moving it across. Halfway through the computations, it reverses where you now start getting reductions, and that's where your network bottlenecks come in, right? Yeah. Um, so even if you look at things like Hadoop, whatever, right? Any 
massively parallel architecture. The shuffle stage is all about communication, right? And that's where, if you think about it, if you have a cluster of n, right, then you have an end-to-end -end shuffle. That means everybody's talking to everybody. And that's where the contention needs, needs to, to be resolved. Um, so I think getting your system up to 40 gigs is good, but it needs to be multiple. <laughs> yeah, for me, that's just a step. I, mean, I think we have plans to go to 100 gigs. And then, I mean, but that's for me, I, I totally see where, where you are going. But I'm also thinking going to the national resources. And I mean, this is more in a traditional networking sense. I think here the fabric is more within in well, a machine, right? And, 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 and there should be always a test, right? When you're talking about moving data from CERN to here, or you know, long distances, um, the litmus test should be, can I do better than FedEx, right? Because FedEx has a, a limited latency, you know, 24 hours, uh, and unlimited bandwidth. Um, and if you can move that across the network, then great. If not, sometimes FedEx is a better network. Yes, um, and I agree. I mean, we have actually uh, between Anschutz and here, FedEx is the faster way of shipping data. So it's one of the things we want to address: is can we make uh, connect our science DMC with the science DMC at Anschutz, so that we don't have to do shipping of disk drives and, and other things. So totally agree. Okay, and then lastly, I'm gonna uh, switch to data and data management. <laughs> Because I think this is kind of, from my perspective, some of the things we at CU struggle with. How do we man? I mean, we have this large amount of data our faculty produces, and how do we manage that? How do we enable better science by sharing it? I don't know. Has anybody tried getting a data set from another scientist? I mean, this is hard. And then trying to understand what the, the person did. I mean, even in CFD, if you know, hey, the, what they did, and then reading the data in, what the model was. So this is, this is really hard. And it ties into this data uh, revolution, where we have more and more data. Uh, it's more complex, um, and it's sensors, media. I mean, even yeah, myself, I measure when I go running, right? I have a kind of a, a sensor measuring my heart frequency, heart rate, and store that somewhere. Healthcare. And then how do we transfer data to knowledge? I mean, data is, is not and then and into action to really transform commerce, government, and it's really critical. Uh, and it has been really a paradigm shift from uh, hypothesis-driven to data-driven discovery. And NSF is now really also pushing research in collection. How do we uh, store and manage data? data analytics, and then data sharing and collaboration. I mean, in order to really good, get good science done, it would be really nice to get the data sets. And some of the journals now do it. You need to submit your data sets with the publication. You know, do it. But there's a really big emphasis at NSF uh, to advance uh, big data science and engineering. I think they have a couple of calls out there. Um, just want to a little bit talk about data management cycle. Um, so hopefully you write a winning proposal. Your project starts. You do your experiments. Do some analysis. Probably realize, okay, well, we didn't calibrate quite right. Need to rerun some things. Um, and you publish your data. Uh, you publish your your paper. Hopefully you have a data management plan, and if you write an NSF proposal, one of the requirements nowadays is you have to have a data management plan. How do you share your data? Uh, and then by then you end your project. And then what happens with the data? I mean, that's that's a challenge. Is it is it valuable enough to store it, to archive it? Because if you go into a data archive, there is some additional cost because you need to describe your data much better. And then how do we make data reusable? How can I discover, hey, there's another researcher doing the same research, and I want to look at his data sets or her data sets there. So some of the research themes that are really coming up, and I think that might be interesting for this group, is, I mean, NSF is really pushing uh, storage and retrieval and data representation, parallel data architectures, 
policies. I mean, that's one of the biggest things. So we had a data management task force here at CEO. And one of the things we basically punted, we said, okay, we can't really make policy decisions. I mean, we, we made some recommendations for open access and, and to really provide, I mean, encouraging and promoting open access to data and, and publications. But we couldn't really make the decision. So now we have a new committee that actually can make some policy decisions. And, and these are some, these are hard. I mean, these are not easy. I mean, technology sometimes is easier than some of these policy decisions. And then sustainable models for access to data and data preservation. I had somebody from NAS ask me, okay, I want, I like your pedal library, but I really want to buy data as storage for 20 years. And I said, okay, uh, but now you can buy it only for five years. I don't really have my model yet together to guarantee that I, that the data of my storage system is still there in 20 years. So these are some of the, the challenges for, for that. And data analytics, there's a bunch of uh, questions. Data mining, the real SF wants to, uh, to do research to drive that uh, area. And then data sharing collaboration. The use of complex data sets as experiments. Basically, somebody gives data to another scientist, and they are supposed to reproduce the results of the paper they produce. That's extremely difficult. I mean, that, I mean, it's nearly impossible because the whole context, how do you really uh, move that knowledge to in within a data set? I mean, that's, that's really, really challenging uh, to reuse uh, complex data sets. How do you share data across disciplines? Maybe in one discipline, okay, there's a good description. I mean, I think there's Gene Bank, for instance. I think they have a pretty good description of the data. How do you move data between disciplines where uh, sometimes meaning of different words means different things. And then, yeah, how do we remotely access data and data source? So these are some of the challenges that NSF sees on the national level. And one of the things, there was a survey of uh, EduCourse members, and they see similar challenges. Data storage and technology, uh, shared services, data management training, uh, when I did my PhD, nobody told me anything about data and data management, data standards. I mean, you came up with your own naming system. Even my PhD students, I let them choose their I mean, data, their names, their naming conventions. I mean, there, there was no standard. There's no standardization. And I'm actually now working uh, on a CFD data standard uh, group, uh, but there's really not a lot of training uh, for faculty and students. Uh, what are the current models? How do we migrate? How do we metadata? How do we describe our data? One of the things I found interesting from my perspective, uh, kind of on data management, what's missing there? And for me, that was so what's missing from that list? We just talked about this. For me, it's kind of the network because. If you want to share your data somehow, uh, you need to have the right networking architecture in order to really be able to share that. I mean, yeah, it's nice I have this huge data set sitting somewhere, but then if I need FedEx to ship that data, then that's maybe not the best way of, of sharing uh, your, your data. So yeah, data sharing, in my opinion, I'm a big proponent of data sharing. It's really necessary for better science. And I think there is some good, there's some good progress. I mean, journals accept data submissions for data uh, that uh, are connected to a publication, uh, but it's still challenging. The other thing is privacy, HIPAA. I mean, there's all these regulations. I mean, how do you bring that with open sharing? How do you combine that? Um, and there's a big push uh, from the White House. There was a memo to all funding agencies. Uh, to all federal agencies to better develop plans to support public access to federal funded research. Which I think is the right thing to do, right? The feds fund research, I mean, it's at least my personal opinion, there should be open access to publications. NIH is doing this for quite a while. Uh, I think you have, if you have an NIH grant, you have to deposit your paper or your preprint somewhere. And I think this will come for all other agencies. And then access to scientific data. Obviously, there needs to be some type of uh, embargo period because you don't want to just, oh, I create this data set and now I publish it, and maybe another group competing with me 
is faster in analyzing the data because they have more money and more manpower. So there needs to be a sensible policies around uh, data and, and data sharing. And that's one of the things we are trying to work here too at CU. How do we make data discoverable? I mean, there's a kind of an archive here, but it's really more for publications. How do we make it accessible, understandable, manageable? And then there really needs to be a culture of research data managers. Uh, nowadays, I mean, you don't get a lot of credit if you really manage a data set well. I mean, and we have some good examples here on campus. We have NSIDC, the National School and IS Data Center. And uh, even, and NCAR does a really good job in managing that. But the people who manage the data really don't get the credit compared to the computational scientists. They run the new simulation. So there needs to be a change in, in that culture. And then lastly, just a word, I think since you're all interested in data science. So I, I found this, I think it was McKinsey. Uh, was the source here, uh, basically this shortage of uh, people with analytical expertise and uh, skills to understand and make decisions based on, on analysis of big data. This is all I had to say. Any other questions? Are you using Hadoop or any kind of similar technology for storing? Um, no, we, we have so we are, we are exploring Hadoop. Uh, I think we did the tutorial at uh, the EPA, uh, CRC, but we don't. We have a few. So there's a person computer science who wants to use Hadoop. We have a need, I think, for map reduce kind of approaches. But I think Hadoop is a little bit too challenging for some of. Oh, I don't know, reducing one there. Yeah, the file system. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we have this best node, so that's kind of already defeats Hadoop. Um, have you done any um, research on the comparison of doing your own versus, say, um, AWS solution, one of those in the cloud, so that your data and your computer is in the cloud, if they're yeah. professionally managed data center, and you're just shooting the algorithms? Um, we've done not a lot of research. I mean, we did we did some comparisons with the Pella library on on cloud storage, and there's still challenges from my perspective with cloud. As it's the unpredictability of cost. When I mean, you push data there, I mean that's easy. Once you get, want to get your data out, that it becomes expensive. I think there's some licensing issues sometimes. I mean that's kind of suddenly scaling up. So we haven't done much. We are exploring it a little bit. We looked at the pricing models there. Uh, we're comparing it to our lo having local storage, so we're looking at total cost there, and I think ours still uh, compares favorable. Right. Um, in a corporate environment, it's a no becoming a no-brainer, but you have a lot of free human resource in the university systems. Yeah, yeah we have some 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 <laughs> students there. So, so you really have to be careful when you say it's not the cloud, uh, because uh, as we've been talking about. It's the physical infrastructure that actually makes the difference in terms of how you can process in terms of efficiency, latency, response time, uh, your data. Um, so, so you know, when you look at AWS or anybody's not a conventional cloud offering, what you find is that their physical infrastructure cannot handle the, the needs of you know, quote unquote big data. Um, so yeah, AWS has you know do instances blah blah blah. That's great for testing and developing your you know your code and, and your your functions. But when you try to go put it into production, if you actually look at the data flow for any clustered application, right? That is a cluster game, an MVP type of where, where you're segmenting the data, processing in parallel, basically sending, and and then moving the results, you know, to some reduction in spread. The, the shuffle stages that I talked about, it's network communications and cross communication. And there's a tremendous amount of data that's moving from you know, storage to compute, right? And, and when you add all that up, if you're, you know, a thousand nodes are connected by a gigabit ethernet, um, you're going to spend all your time uh, in congestion and and all the switch buffer 
limitations will throw you back out. Um, you're not going to get a work done, right? So when you're looking at cost, it should be cost of real work done and, and the size of the infrastructure, and the total cost of my environment to get real work done. Because it doesn't matter if it costs pennies, but it takes you years to, to get to the result. So, you know, I have, I have some direct experience with this sort of thing. Um, Raj certainly knows about this. Um, you know, it's really easy to go if you have a contact at, say, Amazon to say, spin up 2,000 nodes, and now I have a cluster that's bigger potentially than, you know, this Janus supercomputer. It doesn't do very much <laughs> because I am basically only able to solve trivial computations. The interesting challenge is to go and provide for, say, Overflow or something like that, the ability to get the degree of networking that, that actually becomes less trivial um, in terms of what I can do. Right now, the intermediate step is to go and do something with private cloud. You know, maybe go and do, so use the infrastructure of the cloud that's being built out in terms of OpenStack, potentially test in the public cloud, um, do some things in the public cloud, but if you need to go and have the type of connect infrastructure, you need to do some private right now. Uh, as far as storage goes, what are you guys using? As far as storage goes, you said you mentioned tapes. Uh, are you guys using like solid state drives or deep memory drives or like any sort of? So we have <laughs> SSDs for the metadata, and then we have just SATA for the data because I mean. And we wanted to kind of provide a cost-effective uh, solution. So the, that's the SSDs are for the metadata, so less or things like that. Can you add to that briefly something about the uh, whatever you use to manage the hierarchical data? So we're using GPFS uh, and then TBD Storage Manager. Uh, so we kind of did the low low cost to this. Uh, HPSS, I think that's kind of the expensive solution. So if you would have bought HPSS, you wouldn't have any money left for this or any storage infrastructure. So we really did the low cost. Uh, again, we had kind of field lower cost labor. And so we did this Tivoli and GPFS. And so we basically have a kind of HPSS uh, similar functionality. Could you describe some trade offs with that and something like uh, what happened with that? Uh, say the hybrid system in the pack for the shared. The Ibex system. I don't. I don't know about that. Okay. So I don't know about that technology. What are the data transfer rates between your local storage and your and your nodes? Uh, so reading right back and forth. Between between the, the storage on Janus and and the, the, the archives. Yeah. I think we are right now in the benchmark, and that's my my staff member is owing me that document about the benchmark, and so he's working on on those uh, benchmarks. So I don't have it, but that's on his list because we're working on a, on a kind of a case study. So we are working on the, the data. So right now I don't have it. I think the problem is too. I mean, we have to be careful because you can easily get. Uh, I think you can saturate the network, but you have to be careful how to transfer big enough data sets. So we are still working. So I was wondering how, how interdependent are all of the different components that you guys are using. So when you want to upgrade something like you want to upgrade some storage infrastructure, you want to upgrade some part of the network, like, do you have to rip everything out and build everything? Or is it is it fairly logical? I mean how I guess how much is it totally like you can totally replace the network without having to how agile is your infrastructure? That's an extremely difficult uh, question. I mean, I think we on on the course, which is we basically let's say we want to go to 100 gig, we just uh, put in new cards, line cards on the core. Um, on the storage, we can actually add bricks to our storage system, so we can add another high performance tier. So let's say we want I mean, more than SATA, you want SAS disk and SSDs. I mean, I think that's fairly easy. Um, it's a good question. Upgrading Janus was kind of a 
challenge. Uh, we upgraded from Reddit 5 to Reddit 6, and that, that was a big change for our user. Especially on the software side, and that was a big change for our users. So I think it depends. I mean, it's a tough one to answer. Earlier, earlier you had a slide of that um, that gives that right, the CFRC. The, the FRCRC? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, how do you get involved with that? Is that open or is that? It's open, yeah. Send okay. me right. an email and, and, and go to our website. So. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I have two questions. First one, it seems to me you have competing um, constituencies among the different campuses. Is that true? For example, at Anschutz Health Sciences, we have Biosciences, and it would seem to me they have different requirements for the settings on your high-performance computing, um, in contrast to the astrophysicists of the Boulder. Yeah. How do you reconcile the different constituencies? That's a good, good question. I think just for the diverse architecture, I mean, that's kind of my my approach. I mean, we have some of the uh, like life scientists. So we have these terabyte nodes that are really heavy to use for some. Of, I mean, life science workflows are also different, right? They need high memory phases. They need then massively parallel phase. They need some high memory phase. So this is kind of where right now we're working on having kind of a diverse infrastructure. To, to do these, to, to help uh, with those competing uh, requirements. I mean, tools, I mean, I think Monty had this kind of the robustness of time, for instance, of a code. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's not that easy. I mean, I think we, uh, we, we try with the existing what, uh, means what we have. And so, for instance, one of the goals is next year to have another cluster and it will be probably targeted more towards the life science community with more memory per core, things like that. So, and, and then, uh, yeah, that's all I can say. Second question, you use data virtualization. What do you mean by data virtualization? How would you describe it? What is data virtualization? <laughs> 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 data storage. <laughs> storage. Yeah, storage so you're storing your data in a virtualized context. I would say no, but I don't know if that's the right answer. Are you talking about like HTFS or distributed file systems? So we are using TPFS, but it's more of a parallel file system. And we can build different building blocks, different tiers. I don't know if that's, I don't think that's virtual. At least not for mine. Technically, that may not be. Right. So, I mean, you said that each node does not have its own storage. So, I guess the only way that it could be virtualized is if. Uh, a node's RAM can page out to your central disk storage. I'm assuming that this doesn't happen. Yeah, I mean, if you do that, then you will screw your performance and just screw everybody else yeah. on your machine. <laughs> so, so I'm not, as I said, I'm not quite sure what data virtualization means in your context. I mean, again, we, we, it's, it's modular, at least our arc, I mean, our GPFS, so we can have different tiers, you can have policies moving between the tiers, but that's for me not virtual. Virtualized data, so so I'm not quite sure how to answer that. What's your intranode memory transfer performance? So it's um, a QDR and Filiband, so it's 40 gigabits. Well, they're all the same. Yeah, all of the same. They have a, 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 a factory network in on the channel, so they, yeah, so it's a factory network. So. Yeah, so. A couple of, couple of points. Uh, reliability and resiliency, you asked about you know, how agile is your environment. Uh, well, it's as agile as how careful you are. Right? Uh, so say, take a new cluster, right? you know, triple redundancy to allow for nodes to fail. But the correct nodes have to fail, and the correct <laughs> nodes have to not fail together. Right? Uh, so. Adding resources is one thing, right? You can add more nodes, that's great. Um, but the real challenge when you're talking about scalability is when I add new resources, what does it take to actually get those resources to be useful, right? So again, sticking with the example. If I have a thousand node or a hundred node cluster, right, and I have 20 more nodes, right? How long will it take before those 20 nodes can be useful as a single 
cluster, right? And if you're working on a large long-term project where you have data that's you know has life cycle of months and years, then you actually have to migrate and rebalance your data. Now you're talking about moving terabytes of data across that network uh, to, to get it to be a useful state, right? So it, it's a very complex question to answer because now, yeah, that's just at a physical level. The, the real trick is it actually depends on the application and how they're using the data, right? Um, so it becomes, yeah, that's another dimension to, to, to things. Uh, but a couple of points I wanted to ask when you were talking about uh, sharing data, et cetera, right? One of the biggest challenges is this is kind of, I think, a misnomer. When we make the distinction between structured data and unstructured data, um, I don't like those words because the unstructured data is really raw data, right? Before you can actually use it, it needs to be put into some structure, even if it's a semi-structured form like a key value pair, right? But you can't act on data if you don't know what the different elements mean, right? Uh, so I think one challenge for shareability is really to be able to have a agreed on standard of not a standard schema, because that will never work, uh, but a standard in self-describing data, right? Yeah. You should be able to say, you know, here's my data bucket, right? Yeah. And, and, and here's how you interpret it. Because without that interpretation, that key, you're not going to be able to do anything with it, right? Uh, Text-based data, which everybody focuses on when we're talking about things, it's easy, you know, you can apply all sorts of rules. But what happens with binary data? Well, and that's, that's, I think, where these data standards, that's why I'm involved in this computational fluid dynamics data standard. We have this document before it sits, which describes basically in detail what is a grid point and how is it represented? What is a, what, what does pressure mean? I mean, simple things, but really describing that in detail but that's discipline-specific data, I mean, metadata or a description of the data. And then I think you have to make the data discoverable. How do you find out that this data set even exists? Right. And this is kind of where the library side comes in, describing that, uh, kind of so it's discoverable and, and, and people can search for that. I totally agree. I mean, and then I think it's per field. Each field needs to come up with their own standards. And that's a very, very difficult, I mean, because if you bring whatever, under fluid dynamics into the room and you say this is how we want to uh, kind of uh, standardize on naming and grid point and whatever grid ordering or whatever for unstructured grid. So it's, it's a very difficult uh, uh, problem. But it's more like uh, to agree on a kind of a, uh, some standard definitions. Right. I mean, it's almost like you need some compiler uh, doing you know, data. We, we actually have somebody, we have something. We, Call it, he calls it a compiler to check basically is the, are these files compliant with our description because it's basically, yeah, you're totally right. It's, it's like a, a, a kind of a, a programming language. So we, we can run those uh, compiler on the data and it knows, okay, this is conforming to our data standard. Or, hey, this data set doesn't conform with our data standard. Here are the the holes because it gives you basically a syntax error for, for the data set. And I think how long does it take? It doesn't take that long. Because it only reads basically the the, the descriptors. It doesn't need to read the whole data. Because what's the data part? Well that's that's something we don't uh, yeah, it could have another number in that data set. So we are not looking for that. We're looking more does it comply with our description standard. So that's kind of the compiler I'm talking about. It doesn't check uh, yeah, is the pressure reasonable or I mean things like that. You told me this is your Yeah, you say, okay, there's a pressure in whatever in there, and then suddenly you have a, a value that's not well, and uh, there's something wrong with the simulation, obviously. But I still think the description is fine. I mean, that's what the intent was. Maybe you took your simulation to up, and you wrote another number in there. But the code is not assuming the description. I mean, how many there's some other instance of the nature. So, if you require the code to be 
description, then you probably guarantee the description's right. Yeah, description's just a documentation. Yes. You know, this parallel state that will cause you problems if you're really trying to do genuine discovery. But that's, I think that it's more about the quality of the ones then, right? Is your data that's in there really, is it a good, whatever, in this case, a CFP simulation that, that, that sorry, gets valid, valid result? So that's more, in my opinion, it's more quality of the data set that uh, issue. Well, you so you just said to be admitted to the new occupation, a data curator. Um, has there been any uh, discussions about specialization? Uh, Michael's a question about you know, different disciplinary requirements. So having to say one university build their system for aerodynamics and another one for fluid or whatever, you know, different disciplinary areas so they can each specialize. Well, I think universities try to kind of uh, support their researchers, so I think they try to have the mix of, I mean, and then brings in the funding. Uh, so I don't think, and even if I, I think there is, in, in Exceed, there is some reason, I mean, they try to keep a diverse environment. So I look at San Diego, they have Gordon for more data intensive, uh, and then there's uh, TAC, I would say it's typically more compute intensive. So I think, they, and then Pittsburgh has kind of a shared memory machine, and I think it's kind of on the last leg there. So I think they try to diversify, but I think it, that's, that's fine. So um, in several of the slides, they reference NSF and funding. And so my question is kind of on the, on the business side of uh, where do you see the future? Where do you see the next five years of, of funding um, for HPC at the seed holder? And um, would you see a, more of a component of, say, industry funding the, res the research or funding the HPC effort um, to make up the federal challenges? Um, Throwing out one last thing, throwing out RPI's idea initiative. Is, is there anything like that happening under it? Is RPI kind of an outlier in terms of that big data initiative? Good question. I think the first one, well, I think we, we all know, I mean, the federal agency budgets are not going up. So I think there's increased competition uh, for that. I think the CU is trying. I mean, I'm actually pretty impressed. I don't, I don't know about this new office of industry engagement. And they are really, so we have a couple of companies that are interested in running on giants and they really kind of try to remove the hurdle. Um, I don't know how much that really can bring in. I mean, that needs to be seen in my opinion. I mean, that's kind of, we are trying to remove hurdles to the workers industry and make it easy, having standard agreements. I don't know if that uh, makes up. I mean, there's every, if you have one company that's trying to benchmark giants if that can work for them. Um, and then there's another company that is interested, but they have some commitments as the senior of Kansas right now. Um, I think it needs to be seen. I think there's some potential there. I don't know if they can make up for all federal funding. I think that needs to be seen. I've, I have one bad experience, so but I hope this industry, this works. So I had a interest that they wanted to work with me, and it took a year to negotiate the NDA between CU and the company. And I basically said, no, I don't want to do it. It takes a year to negotiate the NDA and sign the NDA. And it's just to talk. I'm not interested in, in that work. So I hope this new office will kind of make those hurdles and increase those hurdles. The other question was RPI. And what was the Well, yeah, it, was, it wasn't fully formed, but I thought maybe they gave an example of um, a few months ago or over the summer, they announced this big data initiative, the campus wide initiative, they call it IDEA, Leonard Jim Hendler. They, they announced the campus funding that $8 million dollars and then bring in another $20 million industry. But I, I read the press release, so I don't know how that actually breaks down. Is that NSF money that's $80 million? Um, you know, so it's going to NSF project um, $80 million. So. Good question. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think we are trying to, to work on data and data management. Uh, more on that's not supported by the national infrastructure. I mean, things that are CU assets. I mean, I think that's kind of uh, our emphasis right now is how do we set up an infrastructure for data and data sharing. Um, so one of the things is the pedal library, you cannot 
going to connect that with uh, Globus, and they have a data sharing uh, module. So as a researcher, you can basically say, hey, I can store data on the Terra library, and I can share it with somebody at the uh, University of Kentucky and somebody at Princeton, and I can create my own group. So that's one of our next steps. But I don't, we don't really have a that kind of kind of investment in HPC. So, so that, that's maybe a very good example. Yeah. First. So with the uh, short shelf life of supercomputers and the long planning stages, do you have to essentially start planning the next one as soon as one is delivered? Uh, not quite, but I mean, I've been working, I think we are now close to, for next year, getting a, a kind of, I don't think we get something as big as Janus, but I think we're getting kind of every year a new cluster uh, for the campus. So, but I think, yeah, we have to, and then we're looking at proposal opportunities, obviously. I mean, it, it's constant trying to, to find resources to provide uh, computational cycles or other uh, resources. OK, no other questions? Thank you so much, Dr. House. That was wonderful. Uh, we have to be out of the room. Do we need to be out of the room? No. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, we'll take a 10 minute break. Just a little. Yeah. Thank you so much. You are? I'll Yeah. 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 Well, you know, generally what happens is you remember things when you were a lot younger. When you were
Yeah. 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 Yeah.